next speaker um, we'll move on is Mario Hernandez, and uh, he's with the Engagement Committee of the of Future Earth. Um, also, uh, I'm working with him on the task force on observation data and information um, for Future Earth. So, with that, yeah, thank you, Danny. So, <clears throat> good afternoon. We are basically the new child in the neighborhood, so don't expect that we have tremendous amount of data, but we have tremendous needs uh, of setting a challenge with you. So we are, very briefly, what is Future Earth? Is it a platform or a network of research on global change? We aim to connect global knowledge, and to, the donors are asking us to make better uh, type of research in order to accelerate sustainable development. And so, basically, they are asking us to work interdisciplinary and to work uh, or solution oriented together with decision makers and to assist the societal transformation that are necessary for sustainability. So it's an international partnership committed to use science and technology. The vision is a sustainable world where decision making is really making use of science. And basically, as I mentioned already, promoting interdisciplinarity research and partnership, and that's what we're searching here with all of you. It builds on a series of research problems that have been there during the last 20 years. It does not mean that all the problems disappeared, so this chart is a little bit confusing. It's more that there, is, there will be a transition period in order that they change to take now the new approach that Future Earth is promoting. So the World Climate Research Program will be there. IGBP will continue with the same impetus that it had, but will now uh, embrace the approach of future Earth. My domain is Earth observation, so you will see that I'm abusing about uh, satellite images. So as, as I said, it builds on decades of projects and research. Has to be now oriented to questions that are relevant to the needs, needs of policymakers. And donors are forcing us to do co-design with all the stakeholders and then implement the project in co-production with all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So we need to work in a solution-oriented. There is a co-design and then all along the project life we need to do the co-production. And then at the end, obviously, there will be other stakeholders that will take benefit of the results. So it's the Belmont Forum that is sponsoring uh, Future Earth. We have these two bodies, and then we have as advisory bodies several organizations of the UN, but basically the funds will come from, from the Belmont Forum. We have four hubs. Uh, today we have the honor of having our executive director here. He is in uh, Montreal, and so we're very thankful for the help of the Paris hub that uh, and has organized by the Oh, oh, five hours, yeah. yeah. I forgot my friends. So, we're not sleeping, then. That's good. So, the Benham Forum will make the call for projects. ICSU will administrate the funds, and then the future of governing bodies will uh, make the registration of the project and uh, see that everything is online. So, we created an observation data and information task force. It's not easy with the ambitious aim of future Earth. And so the first thing we said is, is there a niche? Because we are in a, an extremely crowded area. And what all of you are doing, we don't want to do duplication. So we need to join with you. We need to set up partnership with you. It's absolutely no duplication because there is tremendous work for everyone. We consider that the interdisciplinarity is our other value because the others are very specialized in the different research teams. Then the other issue that we discuss is there is too much data, but it's not easy to access, it's not easy to manage, nobody knows what the data is. But at the same time, there is no data. But is it really there is no data? Because by searching, some people have it. Uh, we don't know exactly where it is. We don't know the format in, the, in which it is. Then our main goal, since we are helping decision makers, is that no matter the data, there needs to be a processing in order to convert that data into information. Because decision makers, they don't want raw data. 
we need to do something in order to provide information to our end users. Then another question that came is, this is the decision maker, but is he really using science? And basically we agree that no. We will need to do some workshops, we will need to showcase what science can do in order to start attracting decision makers. Because usually they are not involved and they are not using science for many reasons. So our niche is partnerships, interdisciplinarity, solutions oriented, so concrete things that the partners are asking us. We will need in some way to do an inventory together with all of you. We will need to focus on deriving information to, to data. And then, as I said, working with decision makers, workshops, and, and showcasing to them what, what science can do. And Paul was asking us to work with concrete examples. So you see the challenges that we have. It's not easy. I'm a fan of uh, old maps because I like very much the old data and knowledge that they have. Here, for example, they thought that the waves were like turtles and then the, the water came out of the, of the shelf of the turtles. So I think that one day, 300 years from here, they will see our PowerPoints and they will say, this was the knowledge that they had at that time. Exactly as we are now seeing. But now we take that knowledge that is produced by science and technology, which is today uh, natural sciences, social sciences, economical data. We need to add some knowledge to play with that data. We need to convert it into information, and then it goes into decision making and to the societal transformation that we need. So that's the main challenge and the main approach that Future Earth is aiming to do. I was working until last year here in UNESCO. My job was monitoring with uh, satellite images World Heritage Sites, and we set up a partnership with space agencies. I'm going to show you an example. This is Iguazu, beautiful site, in a very beautiful ecosystem. We produced a series of satellite images. We show it to the decision makers. They saw that the forest was red, because they were presenting it like that, and that deviated the attention. Then I came back to my team and I said, we need to work everything again. We need to do other values so that the attention is not deviated. We need to take clouds, shadows. We take hundreds of satellite images in order to, run, uh, to fill the, the gaps. <coughs> this is one of the results that we present. This is 35 years ago, it was here. And this is today. Tremendous deforestation converting the tropical forest into agriculture. And the decision makers told us, yeah, but this is perfect because deforestation is stopping exactly the border of the protected area. <laughs> <laughs> we said, yes, that's true, but the whole of the ecosystem is destroyed. <laughs> and then this when we said remote sensing is not enough. We need to bring other questions that will help the final solution. And for there, we need to bring a series of different experts. And that was thanks to the satellite image that was worked with added value that we were able to bring all the others to help finding out the final solution. So I'd like to use the example because that's what we aim with Future Earth. Except that Future Earth is forcing us to do it regionally or globally, and that will be much more complex. Locally is very easy. Now the Millennium Development Goals come to an end. Countries are very happy for the success. Personally, I criticize that. It's not the international effort. It's China and India that have done significant success, but it's not the international community that has had such a success. But we go into 17 goals. Complex, not very easy to monitor, not very easy to understand what, how it will be done. Copying a little bit our colleagues from Chico's that they work on the essential climate variables. We had the idea if we take one goal and we identify the core global data sets that are required to assist in the implementation and monitoring of such a goal. We know we need to define which ones we need to have and which ones would be nice to have, but we can live with those without those. <laughs> which ones are already there in the community? Which ones there is some data and we can repackage a little bit like the previous presentation? And which ones need to be created? 
And we are aware that some will be common to various SDGs. So we are working in partnership with a group of Earth Observation, GEO, that they have also in situ data, not only satellite uh, data. They are working on what they call the societal benefit areas. But then we need to work on the other part in order to have the economics of the political data that is not yet available. And here, we need to launch a partnership initiative that we would like to call it like the Data Alliance, where everybody will have the same credits and where we need to work in developing the data sets. And then, obviously, there must be an interaction between the two processes in order to work together. So the process of GEO exists, and we have been discussing with some partners. We are now doing some fundraising to organize a workshop. We would like to invite much more partners. Intentionally, I'm, I'm not putting here those that are extremely strong in data collection, like Chico's or the International uh, Carbon Observing System. They are very well structured, so they, they will contribute. And the International Society of Photometry and Remote Sensing is going to help us with the data harmonization and integration. Now, if we bring together what GEO is doing and when we finish with us, and we present that to a decision maker, I think that this is how the decision maker is going to see it. It's nice, seems to work, but I don't understand what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, all along the co-design and the co-production, we need to identify what is the type of information that they want the data to provide. Because if we don't identify it, then the data will not be able to provide it, and then we will miss it. Now, if we do it, I think that for the first time in, in the research history, we will be doing a conversation between all the different science disciplines. It has to be an ongoing movement where we need to improve some of the layers will be a consolidated effort, and governments will have a good support to monitor the, the sustainable development goals. And will be useful for many other stakeholders. In order to focus a little more, we could focus selecting the, the sustainable development goals that are related with natural disasters, and we could focus in Southeast Asia, and then extend, for example, to Central America and the Caribbean, where the problematic of typhoons or hurricanes is almost the same. So that's basically what we're trying to do. We could use some examples mm -hmm. of the data sets to provide an atlas in order to make science for society. We can make exhibitions. I was doing exhibitions here at UNESCO and, and they were quite successful. So we can use some examples to bring science to the people. And that's basically the whole thing. Now to Walking in the street somewhere, I found this pile of boxes, and I said, I'm going to use it in a second. You can see uh, they are in the sun, the boxes. It says, keep away from the sun. Some are upside down. <laughs> <laughs> so my message here is that no matter how good the information is presented, if the decision maker does not want to take the right decision, <laughs> we will not obtain sustainability. <laughs> With that, I finish my, my presentation. I'm open to questions. Yes, we have time for questions. So, your point is that we need to influence the, the, the need of the decision maker. Question of the how, to, how can we influence the decision makers to 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 us to do that? No, no, no. Let me tell you, at least with my experience, for example, in, in the in the one I show in Iwasu, we are showing him the problem. Then it's up to him to, to find the solution. And if he needs more help, that's what we brought brought the other disciplines. But we cannot force the, the solution. And another issue is that if we work with a decision maker, all the time we need to reassure him that, that the main purpose is to help him, not to blame him. 
So sometimes we need to discuss with him what can we publish and what should not be published. Because at least in my work here in UNESCO, we found some <laughs> ugly things that the site manager just said, don't publish. But the aim is to help. Thank you. Well, 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 well. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mario. I really like the faculty of the presentation, but I want to put on the table uh, a question about data that is uh, continuing to bother me. Uh, we've been talking within Future Earth for a long time about having science uh, and scientists to think about data in new and creative ways. And it seems to me that there are new technologies that are now emerging that make data accessible to the public and crowdsourcing of data and uh, crowd validation of data uh, have become possibilities for the first time. So I'm wondering whether in the way we are thinking about data, uh, how do we think about who the decision makers are? So yes, Government policy makers, corporate uh, decision makers are one set of decision makers who can use the information in an aggregated way and decide. Uh, but can we do something to also uh, encourage and empower a community and civil society members to become decision makers with data? And I just want to point out this company called Planet, uh, Planet Labs, I think is the name of the company which is launching these satellites which are the size of a little uh, computer and they've got 300 of them and their goal is to cover the whole earth with these small satellites and a three meter resolution give access to everybody on what's happening on earth on real time basis. If you imagine what power this data can provide to the public, you can look in your own backyard and see who's dumping garbage and uh, where the leaks are taking place in terms of uh, oils or what have you. So I'm just wondering what role science might have in thinking about data in that broad sense to both help decision makers, but also help the public to do something about the big challenges that we have. 